and we're live. So welcome, Teacher Likes Books. Hey, guys. And we have a new person in our group tonight to talk with us, and that is Drew. Super excited to have him and um, excited to be talking about our last our last time talking. Cloudfall, hey, I thought you were going to join us. Oh, Mark, on your mom's account. Okay, well, welcome. Welcome. You know what, Mark? I like you and your mom. I know you both. So, hey, Dracon Warrior. I don't know what happened to Warrior. I still think of you as Warrior. Um, but so super excited for tonight, even though it's really sad. Um, so let's... I'm saying that he's uh, backstage currently. I'm sorry? Uh, Michael's in. Uh, he's just oh, he is. He is? I can't see. Oh, Michael. Michael, I'm so sorry. I had to scroll Good. down to see you, and I didn't okay. see you. Nothing personal. He's here. Nothing a bit personal. I have a class from 6 till 7 every night, every Friday Good. night. So Jump right on. Uh, well, good for you. I'm going to have to bike home and change. And, uh. Well, and um, we might get... We might get Cloudfall in here too. We'll see. Cool. So um, yes, Mark says this section gives me all the feels. I know. I I seriously, when I went to start reading this section, I thought, okay, I have to brace myself because I know it's going to be really sad. So um, this this section, this last section, is called the Departing of Arthur, and it is how we will wrap up this book on. Um, on King Arthur, and at the end of our class tonight, I will um, share what our next story will be. We're going to be back to more of the regular format after our summer book club, and we will be doing um, a short story, and I'll be revealing that at the end. So let's jump in with The Departing of Arthur and this first chapter on Lancelot and Guinevere. And it's really interesting because we see this um the the this balance of sadness and happiness in arthur and um he he's like sad because even though everybody's back from the grail and the grail quest is successful he knows that it's all about to come crashing down and it says that there were many seats that were empty and no new name grew for there were no new knights to take the place of those who were dead. So my question is why, why do you think that there were no new knights? Like why aren't there any new knights? The decline of uh, Logris. I mean, obviously, but. I think I just because um, due to fate and all that, um, the the chairs didn't arthur would not have been around at the points or i suppose no new people came to be knighted during the time from when um yeah no new time, people come but why do no new people come maybe there are fewer noble sons born to grow up to become knights okay so like all the people had already done it <laughs> Yeah, I definitely saw this section in the notes, and I definitely looked for, like, a more uh, concise answer, but I think it really just has to do with, like, it's the it's the end. Um, I guess there's a better <laughs> way to put it, but... Knights are not made um, made quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. There's another key point, which is that this is later on with the reference to squires. That's one of the first times you hear anything about those guys. One of the things you'll notice in almost all these quests so far is that these knights aren't bringing along trainees. Okay. You, and then most of the top tier knights aren't getting married and having kids. Yeah. And most of our most of our top tier knights are the children of other knights who are already top tier. And as we know, uh, only top tier knights give birth to top tier knights. It's a strong trend so far. Most of most yeah. of our current top ones, Galahad. Son of a top tier knight, True. Gawain, nephew of King Arthur. There's, and then you get all these guys like Lancelot walking around like, pff, literally, women are throwing themselves at me, and I'm just like, no. 
<laughs> yeah, there is that. Like, there's not a lot of like happy marriages among the knights that might yeah. lead to a new generation of knights. I think Dracon's theory is <laughs> is also interesting. Um, <laughs> Too much smiling. It says uh, in the story, it said the evil which had never quite been rooted out began to stir once more, and that seems to me a key idea. It's like a weed where if you don't dig it all the way out, like if you just tear it off, um, then you will be, um, you'll be, uh, there's Cloudfall, welcome, welcome Alex. Hey. Um, if you don't dig it out from the root, if you only just tear off the top, the weed actually gets stronger. And I think we see that here. Um, and I'm curious, I, I'm gonna ask this again, actually at the very end, but at this point, do you, what could Arthur have done differently? Do you think there's anything Arthur could have done differently at this point to resolve this situation? Maybe gone after the evil again, although. I mean, controversial choice, but what's the church's stance on him divorcing Guinevere? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, it yeah, would solve. So almost every problem that's about to happen. Yeah, or not even divorced her, but just like sent her away, like made her leave. Cause he definitely had the power to do that, to just quietly, you know. Yeah. But we definitely like. Yeah. No, okay. I feel like in a way we definitely have to take into account how these were definitely different times. And I feel like the standpoint on the relationship with um, of men and women were, was very uh, different back then. Like, I mean, throughout this book, we've definitely seen examples of women being seen as prizes to be won. And in that sense, it's less possible. Like the affair with Lancelot and Guinevere was like seen as a kind of thievery and less of like a choice yeah. Guinevere made. Yeah. Well, of course, like in when you're talking about a when you're talking about a situation where almost always there's a primogenitor, like the the the, the king, the next king will be the son of the current king, then it becomes very important that you know for sure that the child is the child of the king as opposed to the child of someone else. And so it's it's an even bigger deal. Um Honey, it's on the cow on the chair in the living room. The guy who just like edged our lawn. It, they, I think they came, or maybe my husband already came. My husband walked away, and I thought that's where he went. Mm. Um, so Lancelot's now the greatest knight, and even the most noble, um, because well, because Galahad's gone, right? And um, because he's recognized this problem with his obsession with Guinevere, but she's not as keen, right? She's not as keen as um, as Lancelot to let it go. And she yeah. really behaves abominably. She, she, Guinevere comes off looking like a total jerk. Mm -hmm. And my question for you is, and the people in the, I'm sorry, I hadn't scrolled down, so I couldn't see that, um, I couldn't see that, that I wasn't keeping up with the chat. Um, yeah. Oh, Drakon says, yeah, Lancelot could have given her, but he does, right? Like he really tries. And it just was unsuccessful, right? Oh, Jay San, nice to see you. Well, okay, Tessa, nice to see you. Um, or read you. That's great. Um, so do you think that Lancelot really loves Gwen? Or I'm sorry, do you think that Guinevere really loves Lancelot? Or does she just love how much Lancelot loves her? I would argue I that Guinevere... I mean, I feel like one of your isn't very much like written well. Like, I feel like they definitely, like, I mean, a lot of the women in this um, book, like, they did um, my girl Guinevere dirty. Like, I mean, but I feel like we aren't taking into account like the decisiveness of Guinevere. But more importantly, like, in all honesty, Guinevere, I'm, I mean, Guinevere in the end, like, she definitely became a nun. I don't think Guinevere can actually grasp the dire, like the desperacy of the situation. And I feel like it's not that she doesn't love Lancelot, it's that she's stupid. It's that given, she's stupid, oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like, I mean, cause in the end she definitely sees like the 
dire effects of her actions and okay. she, like spends the rest of her life mourning them. But I mean, given I the author's uh, description of women as temptress, maybe the author wants us to see Guinevere as somebody who only lusts after Lancelot because he loves her, right? I, yeah, but like, I feel like, yeah, I don't know, I just. What about you, Alex? What do you think? Do you yeah, think that like Guinevere really loved him? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. It's hard to say because I feel like there were a lot of gaps in Guinevere's character. Um, mm. There was a there were so many parts where I just paused for a minute, like, wait, did, did I miss something? Like, was there some inside thought from Guinevere that I just completely like, skipped over? And then I went back, I was like, no, there isn't. So I feel like we need more from Guinevere to be able to say for certain. But I think she doesn't so much as love Lancelot as maybe she loves not Arthur, if that makes any sense. Because by the end, you don't really see anything where like, because at the beginning, it was all like, Arthur and Guinevere, happily in love, married couple, ruling the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. Um, but by the end, you get to the point where it's just like, oh no, we need to burn her at the stake now. <laughs> so like, you've sort of lost that true love aspect of it. So I think it's not so much not that she loves Lancelot per se, but maybe that she just loves anyone who's not Arthur and she needs a bit of a break from Arthur. Mm. Interesting. Um, so she creates this big, so Lancelot leaves, she creates this big May Day celebration. And um, I was wondering, I, I've never really been able to figure out what her motive for this was. Jonathan, I was curious if you had an opinion about that. What do you think her intention was there? So I dug in, May Day celebrations have their roots in pagan celebrations of combo Dionysus and Aphrodite. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is okay. why Constantine at one point banned them. Uh, uh, there's a, that's a separate story, but so this is absolutely meant to be the wildest party that a married woman can throw. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so do you and think she, she brings does the it ten in other order people. to like conjure love? Like, why is she? What's her? What's her hope? What does she hope will happen as a result of this? It sounds like she's just trying to distract herself by throwing the wildest party that a married woman can throw. <laughs> okay, she's, she's bringing thirty people, ten knights, ten squires, ten ladies. And presumably there might be more additionally. Those are just the people worth mentioning. Yeah, okay. They're just uh, going so on for a party. It's it's also one of the only ways she has of leaving the castle area. May Day celebrations aren't held indoors. Mm -hmm. And okay, earlier it mentions the fact that she's like, oh, I really wish I could get Lancelot back, but I can't send anybody and I can't tell anybody. This is literally her only pathway to getting someplace where she might be able to contact him somehow. Okay. That, yeah, that makes sense as a motive. That or makes sense. This is the only time re that she's gotten in the near future. She's the queen. She's got attendance all the time. This is like an acceptable thing to do. Major holiday. Yeah. So Lancelot has gone, but he returns in order to save Sir Yuri or Uri and Lancelot comes back a pretty different guy. He's for the first time we see him as humble. He's really, really sad. Um, and he and Arthur, when when he does save Sir Yuri, he and Arthur are both thinking the same thing, which is, oh wow, okay, this is the beginning of the end because it had been, you know, prophesied that by Nimue that he would do that it would be his last deed before the fall before the passing of logris and so then we have melagron which i think that's a sad moment when both of them come to this realization i think that's sad but um then melagrons who's also um in love with guinevere because who's not in love with guinevere um he kidnaps her and she gets rescued by lancelot of course, and they end up in this castle together until Arthur arrives, and then Lancelot gets tricked by Melagrance and thrown in this like pit and brought food by a beautiful woman who will free him if he will promise to be her love. And I seriously was reading this thinking, wait a minute, haven't I already read this part before? Because this exact scenario is in an earlier story. Did did any of you think, wait a minute, we've heard this before? Yeah, Drew? 
uh, it reminds me, and I think I uh, saw in the previous streams there was a previous mention to this, but uh, the myth of Theseus, Theseus, I wrote my notes. Yeah, Theseus? Yeah. Uh, what about Theseus? Athenian princess. Okay. So I'm confused, it how does this... Yeah, okay. Sorry, it took a second. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so she eventually, this, this woman eventually lets him out after a kiss and he fights Melagrance and of course he wins because he's the best. And again and again and again, we see this idea come up over and over of intention and honor, like that they are the heart of everything. Like Melagrance is definitely going to lose because he's not just the lesser knight, but he, he cheated like that, that idea of honor as part of that chivalric code is so strong. And I think that part of the reason that we have to see this over and over as being so important is because it's what the whole, like we, it's the only thing that will make the fall of Logris be believable. Like mm -hmm. we can't believe it unless we believe that everything hinges on personal honor. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah, there's, there's an additional, I think, strengthening element here, which also ties into the question you led with about why are they running out of knights, which is that Arthur seems pretty convinced that he's gotten the best and the brightest minus one in the whole zone. Like, there's no one left to recruit. They've gathered all the best and the brightest, and if they're not sitting at this table, they're dead, mm. and therefore couldn't. So they're, they're definitely stacking the deck for... Logress being awesome. Yeah. Well, I think it's really hard to read this section, this this chapter on Guinevere and Lancelot, because there are so many points at which any one of the characters could have made just the slightest change in what they did, and it would have spun the story in a completely different direction. Like um, one example is when Guinevere tells Lancelot that she wants to talk to him alone, and he could easily have brought his squire yep. with him. He could have easily just grabbed a nearby dwarf, right? Like he could easily have done something. Um, and, but he wants to meet him alone and he agrees. And so they meet alone in the, um, in the garden. And of course they're overheard and Mordred is watching and she tells Lancelot, you know, oh, I want to see you alone. And he agrees. And Mordred is in ecstasy. And he says uh, this line, these two have given the whole realm of Logris into my hands. And I, when I read that, I was thinking, oh man, oh man, because he's right. Like he handed it, they handed it to him on a silver platter. Like I can see Mordred doing like a stereotypical evil laugh here. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, after we leave this chapter about, um, about, Lancelot and Guinevere, we move to Mordred. Like this is Mordred's moment, right? And it's interesting because all through the book, the authors kind of left Morgan Le Fay and Mordred as very, very minor characters. Like we saw Mordred briefly a little bit earlier, um, but really this is his moment to shine. I don't know if that's really the right word for it, but um, it's it's kind of Mordred's moment to shine. And of course, we're not going to see Morgan Le Fay until really the end. And we're going to see her in a very different way than we have ever seen her. But in this chapter uh, with Mordred, Agravain, which I think I think is a real clue that Sir that it's not Gowan, it's Gawain, because their names have to rhyme, right? Uh, like you got to have a rhyme. Um, so Agravain and Mordred are ready to bring this whole thing down, right? And Agravain tries to get Sir Gawain in on it, but he's like, no dice, because he realizes, Sir Gawain realizes what's at stake. Like, oh, no, 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 this whole thing is going to come crashing down. And some people would think that that's like self-serving, that Sir Gawain doesn't want it to come crashing down because it wouldn't benefit him to have that happen. But I don't think that's true. Sir Gawain is a very, very true knight. He's like, one of the coolest characters in the book, I think. Um, and um, but my question is, if they had all ignored it, like 
if everybody had just kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, look the other way about Lancelot and Guinevere, would it have resulted in a collapse anyway? Or is it the knowledge of it that forces the action? I think the collapse would have been less devastating. Ah. Arthur would have eventually caught on for sure, but there might not have been such a schism um, in the round table. Because do any of us believe for a second that Arthur had no clue about what was going on here? No, I don't. No, Arthur, Arthur had... He didn't want to believe, I'm sure. Suspicions. Alex, jump in whenever. You don't have to wait to be called on. If you have a thought, just go ahead and share it. So Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain sees Arthur already crying in the empty hall at the round table. And I was thinking, okay, he's either crying because he already knows or he's crying because he knows like more about the fall of Logris is sad. So Which is he more sad think, about? Yeah, I think that we find out because when Mordred shows up all bleeding and wounded, the king's like, wait, what happened? I thought you were gonna just go there. I feel like, um, I feel like it's possible that Arthur even maybe sent Mordred there, like, or was in on it. Did any of you have that as a thought? I didn't particularly notice that. I know, it's a, it was kind of a thing that stuck out to me. I thought, hmm. So, Sir Gawain, uh, so Lancelot has escaped, a bunch of knights follow him. And that's really, to me, like if somebody would say, you have to point to the moment where like the collapse really got set in fast motion, like the inciting incident of the collapse, it would be that. It would be the moment when Lancelot rides off with knights because now you've divided the round table. Mm. You've got you've got Lancelot v, you know, versus that and it's that a circular set table now. Yeah, yo, yeah, good point. Um, so Gawain tries to problem solve, but it's not working. The queen is gonna be put to death like burned at the stake and Lancelot is going to have a fate worse than death, which is like from Monty Python, a fate worse than death, worse than that, a fate worse than a fate worse than death. <laughs> pretty bad. Um, my husband just said pretty bad. It's the saddest thing because Sir Gareth and Gaheris, like this was sad. Didn't you guys think that was so sad where yeah. they were opposed to the whole thing. And so they refused to dress as knights and then they accidentally get killed because of course, hashtag mistaken identity. <laughs> um, we need to add the hashtag mistaken Back identity. Again. Definitely. Um, and because of this, this, and um, I feel it was- like they got way less than they deserved. Uh, I'm way less than their just desserts because they're just sort of pushed out. Like they needed to knock off a few characters because they had too many to realistically have a dramatic ending for each night at the end, but. Yeah. Um, it says that Arthur regretted sending Guinevere to the fire, but I'm wondering, I have, I have always thought that when he did, he knew in his heart that Lancelot would rescue her. Like he could safely, like he could save face by saying, well, I sent her to the, um, I sent her there. I don't know what happened. How fall got out of the stream. Let me yeah, sure. send her back in. Sorry about that, Alex. I don't know what happened. No, oh, it's all good. I think I just lost internet connection for a quick minute there. Oh, okay. Um, I, yeah, Dracon's like, Level, where are you? <laughs> um, I think it's I think possible it's that Arthur was just like, oh, I can, I can make it look like I'm in charge here because I will send her to the stake, but I know that she's not really going to die because Lancelot will rescue her. Do any of you think that that's possible? Yep. I do. I wanted to add that in uh, historical firing squads, um, one or more soldiers would be holding a blank uh, or have a, a blank loaded into their gun so that they would have the um, ability to shoot true because they could think that, well, I am the one that has the blank. Yeah, good point. Okay, I can see a similarity there. So Gawain was willing to forgive Lancelot for killing Agravain because 
when Agravain came to Guinevere's room, it was 14 against one, and Sir Gawain did not see that as a fair fight, but he won't forgive the killing of Gareth and Gaharis, and he persuades the other knights to persuade Arthur to go after Lancelot at Joyous Guard, which I think is the most misnamed castle possible. Like here, here are Lancelot and Guinevere. I'm sure they're miserable, right? I'm sure they're miserable in Wales. And, but the, but the name of the castle is Joyous Guard. So that's weird. Um, but they go off and I'm thinking, is there ever a possibility that's gonna end well? Like, is it ever possible that it's gonna end well that all these knights go after Lancelot and Guinevere? No. Is there any scenario under which this all ends with everyone happy? I mean, Lancelot is great and all, but no. Well, I mean, he's a good fighter, but at some point, no. Yeah. Right. And even if they yeah. do all start fighting, then you're going to lose people in the battle. And that's just not a good solution either. I mean, at this point in the story, um, there, if peace is possible, um, that a whole lot hasn't been necessarily broken at this point. Uh, and, and like, I mean, Guinevere and Arthur are, you know, torn apart. And there's definitely some grudges. I think uh, uh, Gawain's brothers were killed. Um, but other than that, it's like three knights in a relationship versus okay. the entire realm of Logris. So if they were able to make peace here, which I still don't agree with. Like the last moment possible. Yeah. This is, yeah, the last chance they have before it all comes crashing down. That's interesting. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. Like if there if somebody were going to write an alternate ending, Drew, I think mm -hmm. I think you have pointed the part where the alternate ending would be set into motion. We're going to see another part later um where perhaps that could happen, but I think it would be more believable here. Um so Lancelot's in this pretty much impenetrable castle, but he's goaded so much by Sir Gawain that he comes out with his knights and there's this huge battle. Gawain kills Sir Lionel and Sir Bors actually strikes down Arthur, which is nuts. I mean, nuts because we've talked earlier, I don't think it was last class, I think it was class before about how Sir Bors is so amazing. Mm. Like this is one of Arthur's best knights. I mean, it's crazy. And Lancelot, oh, go ahead. Bors is like the Neville Longbottom of the King Arthur series. Yes. <laughs> come, yes. Comes out of nowhere from left field and just starts kicking trash and taking names. <laughs> also, yes, Arthur's you're old. So right. They make a oh point of gosh. pointing that out here. But like, yeah, no, Bors is like the Neville Longbottom. He's just like, what's up? <laughs> that is so true, Jonathan. You are my true son. All right. So, um, so then. Lancelot persuades the king to make peace and, and he returns Guinevere to him, but Gawain is having none of it. Lancelot takes off for France and it's peaceful for a while, but then you know what breaks loose. Mordred is pretending to be the king, saying that Arthur is gone. Um, Gawain is dying. Mordred's created a full on civil war. He's been cursed by a bunch of priests with it. This time is like the worst thing that could happen to you because you're going to, you know, go to hell, go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> and he's tried to force Guinevere to marry him. And Gawain realized that all his... Yes, because that <laughs> is so incestuous. Um, <laughs> but it's too late. Um, you know, Gawain has realized that it's his pride that's at the root of all of this, but it's too late, even though he writes a very nice letter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a hot, hot mess. So Gawain has this big epiphany, this big moment of realization that it's his pride that has led to this, that if he hadn't been so prideful about um, his brother's deaths, if he had been willing to listen to the idea that that Lancelot truly didn't know who they were. It was not intentional. He would never have hurt them intentionally. If he had been willing to do that, this would not have happened. There would not have been this big fight because Arthur didn't want it. And, and Lancelot didn't want it, but it was Gawain. And I think that is what is so interesting, that it wasn't actually the major players 
who made this happen. So that is Gawain's big epiphany and takeaway. And I'm wondering what other, uh, um, what other, ooh, Drew, wow, I, I can yeah. see you. Um, so what other, wait, now we, now I lost oh, no. my, um, what other takeaways can we get from this chapter about the plotting of Mordred and how they go off and um, all of that? So what, what, are, what else can we take away from this besides just pride is a bad idea? Stay humble. Don't fall in love with the wrong people. Oh, so do you think that, like, I think that is a really important takeaway. Is it possible to control who you fall in love with? No, but it is possible to control what you do because of it. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. It's okay. Also, it's also that needs to be a t-shirt. That yeah. needs to be, like, post that on Insta. Yeah. It's also possible to control um, who you grow in love with. Because you can meet someone and be like, oh, I really like them. And then if you, you can distance yourself and you can not. But in the world of Arthur, the second you meet somebody, you're instantly in love. It's just how That's it true. Even without the potion. Or well, so then potion. the last like actual chapter of the book, there's going to be an epilogue, but the last chapter of the book is called, wait for it, the last battle. <laughs> um, and I think it's inevitable that it's Arthur and Mordred who face off. I mean, we we had it foreshadowed in the Galahad Lancelot face off, and now we have it here again. And at first, Mordred isn't victorious, but then the opportunistic Saxons come pouring in, which is that evil that Arthur never really rooted out. And it it reminded hey. me. I didn't actually even put these in my notes, but it did remind me of there's um, an event recounted in the Bible where the Lord commands the people to go in and like wipe out all of the like heathens in the area, but they decide, but the Israelites feel so bad about it that they won't, they won't kill everyone. Like they won't kill the women and children and stuff. They'll only kill like the warrior people. And then the Lord comes in and is just like, I told you to kill everyone and you didn't do it. So now you're toast. And I feel like that's kind of what's going on here that, that Arthur was a good guy, but because he didn't fully root out the bad guys, he's going to pay for it. But was it. that because of his being merciful or just because he couldn't? I think because he was merciful. Well, I don't know. So they don't, I don't know. They don't That's a good you, question. They don't, they don't tell mean, you where the Saxons are. Because yeah. it says the north and the east, and that could mean like Scotland, and it could That's mean true. the eastern part of England. But if they're coming over sea, then I'm not sure Arthur could have really rooted them out. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I just feel like, feel like I feel like that would be another way to take the story, like another version of Arthur, an Arthur who does a stronger job. You know what? I'm going to put in the chat. I mentioned this in like our first meeting, but if you like Arthur stories that are like at the time of the Saxons rather than in the medieval time, but more at the Saxon time, this this book, The Sword at Sunset, is my absolute favorite. Um, it's so good. And he's up there at Scotland. That's what made me think of it, Jonathan. Um, so he has this vision. Arthur has this vision of Gawain who pleads with him to make a truce with Mordred. And he says that both of them will die and a lot of their people if they fight. And he promises, like, don't fight him because just give him whatever he wants. Because in a month, Lancelot's going to show up. And you guys are going to be able to take Mordred down. So don't waste this. And it's weird because this sounds so reasonable, but you know it's not going to happen. Like, you know there's no way that that's how this is going to play out, right? Where Did any of you think, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Go ahead and do that and everything will be fine. Who thought that? Anyone? Anyone? Crickets? <laughs> I know. I, I, mean, I, mean, I knew that they wouldn't, but I felt like, but I felt like um, if they did... It would have been cool, but since the whole book has this whole deeply confusing relationship with fate, and obviously um, in the situation that Lancelot and whatever would come, 
that would be a situation where Arthur would, um, Arthur and Mordred, or Arthur might sort of survive that. And I know he didn't die, but you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, and so and then that would be a situation where fate wouldn't prevail, meaning that that inevitably won't happen. And it's very confusing. Uh, it's been a long day, sorry, I can't think. Well, they're both super wary of each other. Mordred I mean, and Arthur are both like, oh, Jonathan, do you want to say also, something? Like that? There's an interesting question for me, which is why do they need to meet in person? Yeah. Yeah, send emissaries. Everybody hates everybody. Nobody trusts anybody. <laughs> yeah, but it's not. pretty easy yeah. for Arthur. Like, Arthur, I don't know how things work here, but it seems likely that Arthur, like, it seems that Mordred wants to hear it in person and have Arthur give him his word in person that this is the deal. Well, maybe he wants to humble Arthur. Yeah, it's... He wants to humiliate yeah. him. Or maybe it's like an honor yeah, thing. It's like, just weird, but say. like this whole vibe of like, why do they gotta, why do they gotta meet? And if yeah. they're going to meet, although this does... No, they're just gonna text each other. It's just like... Mm -hmm. He, you already sent emissaries who had the permission to make a deal. Yeah. But what's so special about meeting in person? I guess I want to like finalize it in a, a really professional manner, I guess. Yeah, it's... I want to do it right, maybe. I mean, also their instructions. I don't like their instructions. Yeah. Well, Arthur, we get to the Arthur should have confidence second. in something, which is his guys are better. Yeah. And so yeah. my instructions from Arthur's side is don't move unless his army moves. Like, forget what happens with the 14 and 14. My people are good enough that I can get out if something goes crazy. But, like, just move if the army moves. And if, if both sides had stuck to that kind of logic, yeah, it would have worked out okay. I could understand Mordred saying if you see a sword charging, because Mordred knows his guys are inferior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Alex, I feel like I caught like that. Maybe you started to say something. Did you have something you wanted to share right here? Oh well, no, sorry. It's, just, it's sort of what you were saying. Um, is that with like why would you want him to like have the meeting in person? Like even if you were to set it up through emissaries or representatives or whoever, um, you wanted to have Arthur and Mordred there in person. I think it has to do with honor, right? Because if Mordred could get Arthur saying like the final terms of the agreement in person, then if he were to go back on his word, that would be like an indirect violation of his honor. Mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting idea, like to make sure that Arthur has no out. Right. Um, he can't say, well, I never authorized that or whatever. That's interesting. Um, um, wait, yeah. it's, I, I read the, I read the book for like a week ago. Why exactly did one of Mordred's knights draw his sword? Um, because he got bit by a snake. He yeah. got bit by a snake and then he just like, the snake set off. he just like, mind blank, let me draw my sword, kill this snake. Oops. Literally, uh, no. mind blank. Actually, I mean, you would think the that Richard would have instructed his knights more sternly, like, "Do not draw your sword unless they do." It says, "I mean, mind blank was the exact sure. phrase to use." It says, "Without thinking," the knight yeah. just instinctively got bit by a snake, and he's like, "Up, oh, time to cut its head off," which brings into question how frequently these guys are getting bit by snakes. That that's such an <laughs> right. instinctive reaction. Like, well, and then it's like, like, "Oh, a snake." Better get out my bubble sword, because mm -hmm. there's a snake. I mean, but like, why can't you just kick the snake? Right, step mm -hmm. on it. Like, there's it's just because they're, they're not strong strong on me with the sword. Besides, they're, they're, all, sword. they're all wearing armor. How is the snake biting um, this knight? Stung him on the heel. The heel might have actually been exposed, because oh. one of the things to note is, especially when you hear the description where they're like, oh, if you see the sword, well, that is an indicator that these guys are not wearing plate armor. Depending on the distances involved, you might not be able to distinguish the glint from a sword versus the glint from plate mail. These guys are these guys are wearing armor that potentially has gaps in it, especially near the articulation points like the armpit. Again, none of these guys would have had armor on their armpit. None of these, like the back of the heel probably also. I mean, that was a weak point even in plate mail. The back of the calf was a notoriously weak point. Well, you would know because you make chain mail. The, um, um, so, so we, we just discussed this, the, the 
the snake bites one of Mordred's men and he pulls his sword. And so now it's all crazy. The battle's in play. And, you know, we've talked about it. Um, we, we've done it as our, um, our moment about participles. Yeah, Strudel Kitty. I was just going to say, you know, um, don't tread on me. Tread on me or bring about the glory of, uh, bring about the downfall of the glory of Logers. Wait, I didn't, I don't really understand what you're saying. So, um, if he, if he cuts the snake's head off, um, he's going to start, start a war. But, uh, if, if he just steps on it, so it's like, you know, um, it's reverse, uh, don't tread on me. So it's, you know, you better tread on me and not cut my head off or you're going to bring about the downfall of the glory of uh, Loggers. I see. Yeah. So there's a, so the author is using, um, Green is using all these present participles that we've talked about in previous classes just to give it so much life and meaning when he's like, they're rushing, they're riding, they're striking, and he's trying to give this battle, this feeling life. of life. Um, and they're all in it to the death. And at the end, only two remain alive, and neither of them are in good shape at Quick all. Quick note. Um, what battle in any of human history has ended with two people, one on either side? Doesn't right. Doesn't like that. Chinese and Mongol War, there's occasional references to stuff like that. Um, Persian mythology kind of includes that. The concept of chess is a contest between kings where if you kill the king, it's over, but the kings can be like down to each other. Did it ever work out that closely? I don't know, but like the idea of the idea of two armies clashing until it's down to just the the house carls and the king, and most of the house carls are dead. That is a, that's kind of a thing. I guess if if any if it is only going to be two people living, it would make sense that it would be the two heads of the sides because everybody else would have died to protect them. Yeah. Um. So Mordred alone is left of his side. Arthur is ready to kill him alone. And Sir Lucan tries to persuade him not to, um, but he wouldn't be stopped. And they end up killing each other. So do you think this is their destiny? Like, do you think that from the moment Mordred is born, he is destined to kill Arthur? I mean, yeah, well, supposedly. But um, I also feel like it's kind of weird that Lucan, like, why couldn't they just gang up on like, Mordred? There's two of them uh, and only one of him. Because like, Arthur is not himself. So, so like, I must finish this why, why would Arthur feel that it was like it had to be him to kill Mordred? I think Grandma, it's that honor. They were wounded. It explicitly yeah, it, calls it, out it, that both of those guys were sorely wounded. They were wounded so bad one of them died carrying somebody. Mm -hmm. They were they also were in no Grandma. condition to fight. Oh. Yeah. yeah, where's the, um, let's see, says, um, he says, give me my, he tells Sir Lucan to give him his spear, and Sir Lucan tries to convince him, like, just leave him alone, he's just gonna die, you know, and Arthur says, I will do justice upon this man who has brought destruction upon the realm of Logris and Sir Bedivere is like, peace out, like good luck to you. You know, I wish you the best. This is not gonna go well. Um, and so they this is another thing. I just think this is one more example of how there was an opportunity to save this. There was an opportunity to fix this. Um, yeah, okay. So Mark is saying, you know, maybe he didn't have a strong will, was being influenced by his mom. Yeah, I think in certain tellings of the legend, we definitely see Mordred as more of a puppet in the hand of Morgan Le Fay in, in a similar way that we see like um, that, that in Harry Potter, even we see Draco as uh, a pawn almost. You know, we, we see that where the young evil as a pawn of the more powerful evil. Um, so before he dies, Arthur persuades Sir Bedivere to throw his sword. Where is it? Hold on. Wait for it. Excalibur um, in the lake and come back and tell him what happened. And Sir Bedivere doesn't want to throw this gorgeous sword in the lake. I mean, really, who would? And so he doesn't and he comes back 
And he says, and Arthur says, so tell me what happened when you threw my sword in the lake. And Sir Bedivere says, oh, um, it just made a little splash. And Arthur's like, liar. I can instantly tell that that's not what happened. Stop lying to me. Go put it in the lake. And Sir Bedivere says, oh, okay. So he goes and he hides it again. And he comes back and he says, yep, I threw it in the lake. And Arthur's like, what happened? <laughs> and Sir Bedivere says, nothing. And Arthur says, liar. How dare you lie to me? You're king. Go throw it in the lake. And so third time's the charm. And when he throws Excalibur, he curls it into the middle of the lake. A hand rises up and an arm out of it. And it takes it. And in the book, and this is this is this part is sustained in virtually every telling of this that the arm comes out and brandishes the sword multiple times, lifts the sword up out of the water and then pulls it back down into the water. And that is the end of it. Whose arm is it? The thing, I, I, I don't know what, have, you, have any of you seen the Adams Family? Thing, the yes. hand, but it's an arm. The Adams Family. Drew, who do you think it is? Um, I would argue that it's Morgana, Le, Le, uh, not um, the Lady of the Lake. I mean, because it said explicit, um, because it did say that the Lady of the Lake was covered in white samite, and that's the same description they used for the hands. And it was Lady of the Lake again. I have, um, I can disprove this theory. When Arthur originally goes to get the um, the sword in the first part, um, both the Lady of the Lake and that the mysterious arm are in the same scene at the same time. Yeah. And also the lady like tells him, go out in this boat and go get the sword from the arm. And he can see the arm and her at the same time. Okay. Lady in your way is the lady of the lake, right? I guess uh, no. not in this story. With her. That's in what it says in the end. In some tellings it is, but not in this one. Hold on. But it was a good guess, Drew. Um, but it said that the hand was covered in white semi. Yeah, there could be more of that yeah. though. Like it could it's be a whole group of them. Trail, right? Yeah. Well, we know there's this whole little mini coven of lake ladies. Well, we kind of see that later, don't we? Yeah. Like we're we gonna see that in the epilogue. Ladies. We're gonna see that. So um they they and then they come to the shore of a mysterious sea, and these fair ladies in black come to get oh, Arthur, God. and they cry when they see him including Morgan Le Fay, uh, which is- Look, it's the Lady of the Lake, also known as Lady Nimue. Uh, but in this uh, one, she, okay, but that's there's- weird. That's weird because earlier they're different. That's interesting. Yeah, but that is one of the good parts of this book is the stuff in the very back. There's like this whole character thing there's some uh, discussion of the armor and the spears. I forgot the definition. The Lake Ladies cult. The yes. Lake Ladies, yeah. Um, I'm personally a walks around with a cup um, follower, but thank you. So Drew is like needs to do a mic drop right now. Drew, Lake Ladies was, International. There you go. <laughs> um, so. Arthur tells Bedivere he's going to go to Avalon to be healed, but he'll return when he's needed most and that Logos will rise again. And that's why Arthur is referred to as the once and future king. In fact, one of the biggest, um, or not biggest, but one of the best known of the Arthurian tales is T.H. White's The Once and Future King. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is why Arthur's called that. And there's this magical element here where like, the mist is rising up. Actually, there is one of the books of, of Arthur called The Mists of Avalon. Mm -hmm. um, and the mists rise up. And we and it, there's this very somber and surreal feeling. And, and I mean, there's a part of us that's like, can this really be over? Because these guys are constantly like coming back from the brink of death, right? But it is. It's, it's the sunset of the sword. And so then we move on to this epilogue because we've still got one storyline to wrap up and that's Guinevere and Lancelot mm -hmm. because what we have ended with is that Lancelot's gone back to France where he's from. Guinevere has gone and become a nun 
ish person. And so he comes back, he lands at Dover. Dover's famous. It's the part that's closest to France. It's on the other side of the English Channel from France. It's those big white cliffs. You've, you've seen pictures of them, I'm sure. And he finds out that Guinevere has become a nun. And he's like, oh, I'll be a nun too. Oh, wait, guys can't be nuns. I'll be a monk slash hermit. And there's just not really anything left of what is so amazing. And then eventually Guinevere dies and Lancelot dies just a few weeks later. And then there's just because dust. Grief. And there's this promise. What'd you say, Michael? Because grief. There's a kind of grief. Douglas Adams says in one of his books, grief is a, a terminal disease in many parts of the galaxy. Yes, exactly. Solution, be a nun. That's right, Tessa and Solution, be a nun. So, um, and this, I feel like in the epilogue, there's this kind of weird story um, about this king sleeping in a cave. Um, I didn't even put it in my notes because I thought it was just kind of silly. Um, I have it here at the end. The shepherd who stumbles, the shepherd who just happens to stumble into the cave where Arthur is with his knights um, uh, lying there waiting to rise again. Um, that part's kind of strange. So and he accidentally wakes him up. And he accidentally wakes him up, but none of the nights. So what do you think are the biggest takeaways like from the book as a whole? What what can we learn most from the book as a whole? As a There's, a lot. There's a lot. Give me something. Nobility doesn't always solve everything. Okay. Um, Be a really noble knight and still there can be a lot of really noble knights and it still won't always end up fine. I don't know if that's a takeaway or... Uh, yeah, I like that. I think that, um, well, there is, of course, like you said, the fact that um, evil grows back stronger if not fully removed. Um, um, there's also the fact that um, I suppose it's also trying to point out that um, all good things must pass. Mm. I think when it, for me, one of the takeaways is that love can be a destructive force. Um, my takeaway, um, I'd say, is that uh, for something as like enormous as uh, the Round Table and like wonderful as Logos. I feel like we have to take into account that something like that can only ever fall divided. Um, like, you, like you always, if if something that big stays together, it will last forever. But like, Ooh. the moment that they break up and divide, that's that's like the end of things like that. Okay, so that's like that is that's an interesting take, Drew, because that's like that we must all hang together or we surely we will all hang separately kind of thing. Like that power of unity. Um, that you're gonna see that if you ever read Milton's Paradise Lost, that becomes his big theory about the fall of Adam and Eve, which is that they split up, that they, that they went to go take care of different parts of the Garden of Eden instead of staying together. And that allowed Satan to come and tempt Eve, which if they had stayed together, wouldn't have happened. And and so that idea that you're saying that unity is where the power lies and that if you allow division to creep in, um, then it will be your downfall. That that's a very um, that's a very legitimate takeaway. What about you, Alex? What do you think? What's a what's an overarching? That's actually kind of perfect because that's sort of along the lines of what I was thinking. Um, oh, it was. I was thinking that. Um, we all sort of have like a role to play. And as long as we stick to our roles and we stick together within those roles, then everything will turn out all right at the end. And even if, you know, we're fated to fail, then we can have that hope that one day Camilla and Lagras and Arthur will return, right? So as long as we just do what we need to do, what we're supposed to do with each other, then we can just keep moving forward and keep having hope. I love that idea that we all have a role to play. And if we play our roles well, Thing. I, I like that because even might the small be, characters in here. Might not always end well, but at least it might end better. Might end better. Yeah. What about you, Jonathan? 
Uh, I mean, the whole book almost reads like a, this is what not to do when trying to run a kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> It's like what not to do: marry carelessly. What not to do? Uh, what not to do? Leave your strongest rival at home when you go deal with a civil war in a foreign country. It's oh, like, there's also um, you've got a, um, I mean, you know, allow yourself to be misidentified. Oh yes, misidentified. Wear the wrong color one day. Right. <laughs> So in the, the, those of you in the chat, oops, we lost Claw Falling. Oh, yeah. Um, um, we, we lost Drew for a second. Hopefully he comes back. Um, in the chat, those of you in the chat, um, so Mark, Tessa, Dracon, tell me, um, those of you there, what do you think? What's the, like, oh, my sword just fell over. Sorry for the sound. Um, what do you think? What's a takeaway here? Um, from this story, like what's something? Okay, Mark says, uh, "Weapon should be named like office secretaries." Yes. He braced his spear, Ron, and ran at Mordred. I don't know what happened to Drew. That's sad. We lost his video. Um, if anybody has any takeaways, there, there's a little bit of a delay for them, I think. Um, okay, if somebody different question, if someone asked you, like they were, you saw somebody in a bookstore holding this book, trying to decide whether to buy it or not and read it, what would you say to them? Like, oh, you should read this book because blank. I would say I you should read this book because it has contributed so greatly to the English language. Not necessarily because of any of the content. Just right, me as well. I think, uh, it's, I think it's something about culture and about how there are some things that you should know about even if you don't really enjoy them. Um, some of the day. great classics, however, I, f I also feel like that that notion at the same time is a little um, over exaggerated by a lot of people. And that the value of classics are not as great as they seem. I'm going to think... have to remove you from this stream. Yeah, so. I'm never talking to you again. I know. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I feel like some books people Ooh. like to say hey, that you have to read this. We've got to somebody understand. in the back room. Is he back? What? No, I yeah. can't. Uh, but I, there's no video for him. No. He says his computer died. Oh, there we go. There he's back. Hey. Yeah, oh no, your computer died. I'm sorry, board. Drew. Yeah. So sorry. we're um, we're discussing. Okay. So I want to hear Michael. I want to hear Michael finish his thought about because I think you you got interrupted in the middle of your thought about why you should read this, and then I want to hear Alex, Drew, and Jonathan's take on it. So I would. I wouldn't necessarily want to dictate the reasons for somebody reading. Like I wouldn't, I would never say to somebody, you should read this book because it teaches such a lesson. That feels to me kind of invasive. Um, but I would say you should read this book because it has interesting lessons in it that you might, that might prove valuable. Uh, okay. I wouldn't pick any one moral or, thought but yeah. okay alex yeah to sort of spin off what you said before not so much the um the contents of the book but just the concepts um there's a lot in here i think that you could generally use and take to apply to other things so sort of like a classic but also it's just a fun read so i would recommend it because it's fun <laughs> you can blow through it pretty quickly too and still get a lot from it also um, it's pretty straightforward, but it also gives you a lot to think about. There's a lot of different facets to the story, a lot of different ways to read it. And so I think no matter how you read it or where you read it or when you read it, you're still going to get something from it. So just like whoever you are, wherever you are, give it a try because there's something there for everyone. Everybody will get something different out of it. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Drew, what do you think? About where I'm talking about, I'm sorry, I maybe added you in. Well, you may have missed the question. The question is, if you saw somebody um, picking up this book in a bookstore and you were going to tell them that that you recommended that they read it, what would you say? Like, what would you say would be a good reason to read this? Like, oh, yeah, you should read this book because blank. I mean, I feel like about. Arthurian legends, uh, I feel I think you may, may have iterated this before, but uh, Arthurian mm -hmm. legend is very, is heavily uh, referenced and used in lit a lot of literature today. So 
I'd say that this um, this kind of um, no knowledge is pretty helpful for reading future books. Yeah. So you and you and Strudel Kitty both pull that out that idea that it's like um, and and Michael said it like early in Jonathan too early like in our very first um, in our very first discussion about this book was that like almost every trope every character every type every archetype exists in here you know um jonathan what do you think um, so much along those same lines it's in all fairness if you run across yeah. an english-speaking author born after king arthur tales were a thing almost it is impossible for them to have discussed honor duty or government real politics style government without in the back of their mind somewhere having had this in a foundational role like if we think chivalry king arthur's in the back of our head if we're thinking the relationship between military and government if we're thinking it's just it is so utterly inescapable that once you read it it will illuminate a lot it, it just informs you a lot about especially when authors are taking shortcuts. Not everybody explains every single step of their logic. And if you know the King Arthur stories, speaking to somebody who's never read them, once you know them, a lot of those shortcuts in logic, shortcuts in explanation, fill in the gaps. These, this is the gap for a lot of that. Did it make any of you want to read more Arthurian legend? I mean, I saw Michael put in the chat that he wants to like write some Arthurian fan fiction, which I'm totally here for that. I would love to read that. Um, oh but I'm wondering if um, if it made any of you want to go read any more of the Arthurian legends that exist. I know I've said this like over and over again, but Oversea Under Stone, I love that book. The rest of the series is horrible, but the first one is great. Okay. That's you want to put that in the chat? Arthurian legend. It's fan fiction, but okay. that, I'm anything. just upset. Y'all have disowned me as as a friend. Hmm. No, we haven't we disowned haven't you, you, but we, we need to revisit this whole anti classic stance. You yeah. Brought. That's not what I meant. What I meant was that classics are amazing, and often the books are really good, but people often overestimate. Um, how much an individual person needs to have read every single book that was slightly relevant to society at any one I point. Can, I can agree with you on that. I can agree the with you The thing is, if you that. enjoy reading all of those books, I love... Like, all of them are worthwhile, but trying to read every one would... Um, I'm not yeah. sure there are many... There are enough hours in human life to read every book. I don't see it as a roadblock, as uh, an opportunity, I guess. And you don't have to read everything, certainly. I mean, there's no like one list of books that you should read to have a good understanding of Western literature. Right, and that's what I mean. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could try and divide things then, because when I think of King Arthur, yeah, I think archetypes. Like this is deep. Yeah. Um, and uh, don't get me wrong, I like this author, but uh, Charles Dickens, Quite frankly, I've skipped him. Really? I've read, I think I read one of his books once and I definitely was not paying much attention. It's I was also paid by the word. It's referenced so. all the time. But that's because but you the references had, are more in like a meme status, not archetype status. But that's because yeah. you had you had Tale of Two Cities assigned to you as required summer reading from a teacher with a degree in PE, not English, who just wanted to ask you wow, questions. That's weird. Like, what color shirt was the guy wearing in the third chapter, fourth paragraph on the sixth page? Like, wow, you did it. Uh, yeah, that can definitely be a bad experience. I think you're. I think that, like Joseph, your brother, another kid of mine, I think he had a different experience with Tale of Two Cities because. I ran a whole study group all summer with him and his friends about it. See, the and it was a it's, it's a powerful book. I'm not saying it doesn't have an impact. I think that its impact didn't create archetypes or enshrine archetypes for us. It, uh, it yeah. created, I, it, I called it memes and archetypes and you could argue that memes are archetypes, but for me, memes are like a little more shallow where it's like, 
if somebody says the meme enough, you can figure it out. Like you don't have to read Tale of Two Cities to figure out the basic gist of it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, that kind of stuff. It's, if you see it pop up enough, you can understand it without even reading the book necessarily. The book will add more depth and color to it. Okay. King Arthur's like, it's hard to think of something that we have that came before it and laid a foundation that it built on. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you have Homer, but right. not much aside from that. Well, we, we don't have much records or anything that would have been there. I want to thank you guys all for participating. So Alex and Drew, who joined us tonight, Michael, who's been here with, uh, and Jonathan, everyone, and Strudel Kitty, um, lots of times. So thank you guys so much. Um, we Thanks, are, everyone. as I mentioned, yeah, um, in August, going to return to regularly scheduled programming, um, August 27th. But um, I think that we'll consider maybe doing another one of these more discussion-y book club types as um, as opposed to like the class type at some point in the future. So stay tuned for that. Um, let me see, I'm gonna see if this works because I want to reveal, um, yeah, okay, it's putting it, let me, I'm gonna actually- I can almost see it, I can almost see it behind the camera. I can almost see it. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna remove everyone from the stream slowly um, so that you can, we can all see it. Ta-da! And then even me, let's see here. We're going to do me. Let me, I'll remove my. I can't show myself and I can't talk and do it. But if you didn't see it, I'm going to add you back in. If you didn't see it, the story is The Scarlet Ibis. Um, the Scarlet Ibis, uh, which is a, a good, it is, it's a sad story. Um, just a heads up. By whom is it written? And that will be, I'm sorry? By whom was it written? Um, don't even remember the name. James Hurst. Um, okay. What? James Hurst. James Hurst. Okay. Um, and that will be August 27th. Okay. Um, okay. And Dracon's asking what video editing software do I use? So I'm not editing any video. I am streaming on a platform called StreamYard. I, all the time that we had done class until very recently, I have been using Streamlabs OBS, but I found it extraordinarily difficult. And mm -hmm. so um, StreamYard got recommended to me and I've been trying it. I really like it because it allows me to do that highlight thing. I love so, 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 so much. So um, just, I want to say thanks again to everyone and I will see, I'm going to take us out um, here. Let's see. I'll take a few of us out of the stream. It, it, it just keeps hiding it though. Bye everyone. We'll Bye. Uh, again <laughs> um, and we will be ending with a scar with the Scarlet Ibis, uh, not ending, but we'll be starting off the next school year, essentially, um, for those of us in the United States with it. And the link to the PDF for the story, Dracon, I will, um, you can get in a number of ways. I will put it in, um, I will put it in the uh, description of this video l later. And then I, it will also be, I'll be emailing it out. And also you'll be able to go in the next few days on the, um, and the Gifted Guru website under English class, and you'll be able to get the details on that as well. Um, so you'll get that that link in any of those ways. So um, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm just going to end with showing it. Um, and so thank you again so much, and um, so long to Arthur. So sad.